You're listening to the N2K Space Network. And now, a word from our sponsor, SpyCloud, the cybercrime analytics leader. SpyCloud disrupts cybercrime by telling you what criminals know about your business and your customers, so you can take action to prevent ransomware, session hijacking, account takeover, and online fraud. SpyCloud constantly recaptures and analyzes new data from the criminal underground, including credentials, session cookies, and PII siphoned from malware-infected devices. With knowledge of the specific exposed data criminals have in hand from InfoStealer malware on managed and unmanaged devices, security teams can respond with a more efficient and effective process called post-infection remediation that fits seamlessly into existing incident response frameworks. Get SpyCloud's post-infection remediation guide outlining the seven steps for preventing a malware infection from becoming a full-blown ransomware incident. Visit spycloud.com slash cyberwire. That's spycloud.com slash cyberwire. And we thank SpyCloud for sponsoring our show. In the U.S., we've spent the last few days indulging. First with all the food at Thanksgiving, and yeah, then there's the shopping. Black Friday, Small Business Saturday, and then Cyber Monday. My wallet's feeling a little tired, but today it's about giving back. Giving Tuesday was created in 2012 as a simple idea, a day that encourages people to do good. And we think there are plenty of options for giving to STEM charities today and all year round. Today is November 28th, 2023. I'm Maria Varmazis, and this is T Minus. Firefly successfully tests its Miranda engine. SSC completes a critical design review for its Epoch 1. Astra raises an additional 2.7 million in needed capital. And our guest today is Martin Coates, CEO of Orbex. Before we get into our Intel briefing for today, I wanted to go back to that idea of Giving Tuesday for a moment. Now, we've had a number of great nonprofits on this show in the past seven months. These organizations support educational outreach, engagement, and opportunities to launch, and they reach areas that would otherwise get overlooked. So at the bottom of our show notes for today, we've included links to some of those that we've spoken to. You can go back through our episodes and search for AIAA to find out about their foundation or Higher Orbits, Cosmic Girls, Girls in Aerospace, Teachers in Space, Astrofemina, and the Experimental Sounding Rocket Association that puts on the Spaceport America Cup. Or you could find a student team to support. A lot of these ideas and these organizations need funding, and they also need support in other ways. You see, giving doesn't have to be just a monetary donation. It can be your time, your mentorship, and your promotion. So we hope you find something to give back to today. Okay, now on to today's news roundup. And we do love a rocket engine burn here at T Minus, so it's only apt that we're starting our briefing with a static engine test. Firefly Aerospace has completed the first hot fire test for its Miranda engine that will power the first stage of Northrop Grumman's Antares 330 and the medium launch vehicle that the companies are developing together. The critical milestone was completed just over a year after signing the initial contract. In addition to the Miranda engines, Firefly is designing, manufacturing, and testing the first stage structures for Antares 330 as well as the structures and fluid systems for both medium-launch vehicle stages. 
And we recommend you check out the image of the green flame on this test. Yep, it's green. <laughs> By following the link in our show notes. It's green. U.S. Space Systems Command's Space Sensing Resilient Missile Warning Missile Tracking Missile Defense Program Office, yes, that's the office name, successfully completed the critical design review for its Epoch-1 space vehicles. And with the completion of the review, the program office will begin manufacturing six space vehicles scheduled for delivery and launch in late 2026. This will be the first group of satellites for its future constellation, designed to track high-speed missiles from medium Earth orbit. The U.S. Department of Defense has released a request for proposals to provide worldwide low-latency proliferated low-Earth orbit, or PLEO, services and capabilities in order to meet the mission needs of DOD partners. The resultant indefinite delivery, indefinite quantity, or IDIQ contract, would provide PLEO services and equipment at the task order level, up to $900 million worth of task orders will be awarded over the next five years under the contract. And if you're interested, you'll find more details about this RFP by following the link in our show notes. Astroport Space Technologies and its parent organization, Exploration Architecture Corporation, also known as XARC, have received a combined $1.3 million in NASA Cyber Sitter Awards for development of extreme environment landing pad technologies. The Sibir Sitter Phase 1 and Phase 2 awards will focus on development of lunar construction and operations technologies that are needed for lunar surface landing and launch pads in support of the NASA Artemis program. And we opened yesterday's show with news that NASA's administrator Bill Nelson is on a trip to India ahead of his visit to COP28, but we're surprised that there hasn't actually been much update since he arrived. So far, Bill Nelson has met government officials to discuss NASA training an Indian astronaut to fly to the International Space Station. Rakesh Sharma is expected to go to the ISS in 2024. India is working towards having its own space station by 2040, and Nelson said that NASA would be happy to help India in building its space station and using it for commercial purposes. There's been no formal agreement on that process yet so far. Astrospace continues to hit the headlines as the company scrambles to find a long-term solution to its financial woes. The company has raised an additional $2.7 million in subsequent financing from two existing investors and the company's co-founders. Astra is exploring the possibility of going private to save it from folding, a proposal that has been raised by its co-founders Chris Kemp and Adam London. Japanese telecommunications companies Nippon Telegraph and Telephone Corporation, NTT Communications Corporation, and SkyPerfect JSAT Corporation have announced their partnership with Amazon's Project Kuiper to bring satellite connectivity options to customers in Japan. The companies expect to use Project Kuiper LEO satellite connectivity services to enhance communications availability and resiliency for Japanese customers. Japanese businesses will be able to use Project Kuiper connectivity to support a broad range of applications, including Internet of Things, predictive maintenance, fleet management, remote manufacturing, and more. Customers will also be able to use Project Kuiper to connect to Amazon Web Services, or AWS, to run advanced technologies such as machine learning and AI. And I'm going to leave you with a visual story to end our news briefing today. <laughs> China has released the first high-resolution images of their Tiangong space station in orbit. Yeah, I know. We're a podcast, not a visual medium. So I'm just going to implore you to go and check out the pics of tubes and solar panels in space by following the link in our show notes. It's honestly really cool. You should definitely check it out. And that concludes our briefing for today. Stay with us for the second part of the show and our chat with Martin Coates from Orbex. And you'll find those links that I was mentioning along with further reading on all the stories from today's show in our show notes. We've also included a few additional stories for you. One is on the case for LEO satellite connectivity in a $50 billion EIS contract and another on the Space National Guard. All these stories and more at space.n2k.com. Just click on this episode. AT-Crew, if you're just joining us, welcome. 
be sure to follow T-Minus Space Daily in your favorite podcast app. And also, if you could do us a favor, share the intel with your friends and coworkers. Here's a little challenge for you. By Friday, please show three friends or coworkers this podcast. That's because a growing audience is the most important thing for us, and we would love your help as part of the T-Minus crew. So if you find T-Minus useful, really hope you do, please share it so other professionals just like you can find the show. Thank you so much. It means a lot to me and all of us here at T-Minus. This episode is brought to you by Palo Alto Networks, the leader in cybersecurity. As AI-driven attacks increase, organizations can't afford to have network security that's stuck in the past. Discover how Palo Alto Networks can help you predict what's coming and proactively secure against it with a zero-trust, AI-powered network security platform built to secure whatever, whenever, wherever. To learn more, visit paloaltonetworks.com slash network security platform. Our guest today is Martin Coates, CEO of Orbex. Now, Orbex is building a spaceport and launch vehicle in Scotland. And I started off by asking Martin to tell me a little bit about the Peatland Restoration Research Project. Yeah, peat, as in peat bogs, that Orbex is involved with. To dig the road and the pad for the uh, launcher, uh, we have to remove peat. Um, and we wanted to make sure that it, we weren't just dealing with the mitigation of damage on our site for the for the development and that kind of localized restoration. We wanted to uh, support a, an improvement program. So we're looking at how we can use that to improve degra- degraded areas of peat um, and check out things like water levels. And of course, it's using um, data from satellites as well as ground radar data. So it's kind of got a, a nice extra attachment for for us in this industry to be uh, looking with working with too. Yeah, the the thing that fascinated me when I was uh, reading about it is a personal thing for me hearing about how space technology, especially companies that are working in space like your company are doing things that are directly benefiting us on earth and the peat bogs are there they can, can store a great deal of carbon but as you mentioned like there's a lot of issues with uh, sometimes they can be degraded or damaged. Can you, can you walk me through a little bit about the project itself, uh, if, you, if you don't mind, uh, uh, maybe starting from the beginning of, of who's working on it and how, uh, how she came to work with Orbex? First of all, how it, how it came about was through the uh, connections we, we have playing a part in being a, a good citizen and our uh, general uh, desire to be a, um, the least environmentally impacting launch vehicle company that we can be, which is perhaps unusual in the world of space, which is hitherto quite the opposite. So then in in terms of the the specifics here, we're looking at water levels and what connects us to that particularly is we have a floating road to connect the main road to the launch pad. Uh, And by using a floating road, it allows us to avoid disturbing the water levels across the peat bog. It will move up and down and and, uh, the water can flow underneath it and around it. There's even tunnels for water voles to go through it as well as other uh, mammals and so on. So it, it's just making sure that the the natural uh, fluids can can move around, and, and what does that do to um, yeah the, the the rest of the environment? Georgina Page is a, a PhD student at the University of Stirling, um, and she's been uh, supported by Nature Scott through their peatland restoration program as well, and it's called Peatland Action, using largely high-resolution remote sensing radar, which is synthetic aperture radar, SAR, if you know the details of it, is um, yeah, looking at things like seasonal fluctuations. So, um, yeah, obviously, imagine it's a lot wetter now than it is in summer, particularly when we have the, the, the drought. Uh, and so you, you have to bog breathing, uh, which we're looking at. Uh, so they're using a certain amount of peat taken from our spaceport uh, to be used in a, a laboratory to recreate what that term bog does uh, in a more closely controlled setting. 
That is fascinating. I So much about what your company is doing, uh, I, I just really appreciate the philosophy behind it. And uh, I really... Um, not just uh, this project, but also uh, with the spaceport that your company is in the middle of building right now, and also your launch vehicles. The philosophy behind trying to be as low impact as possible in a in a field that you know notoriously is is often not <laughs> that it, it is a really wonderful thing to see you actually working towards that. Um, at, for our listeners who may not be aware, could you talk a little bit about the spaceport that your company is currently building? Because we love spaceports on this show, <laughs> and we're really fascinated by the one that you're making. As implied, it's sitting sat in uh, two hundred thousand hectares of of peat bog in Caithness and Sutherland, which is the northernmost coast of of Scotland on the mainland. And if you do know Scotland, it's not far from Boonray nuclear power plant uh, in the Kyle of Tong. So a very pretty area. Which is a, another thing we have to look at is making sure that the visual impacts are uh, minimised, not just the the physical impacts of the including a, a design of a, a visitor centre, which we will uh, build after the, the initial launches have gone through to um, enable other visitors to come through uh, when it's non-operational and see the work we're doing as well as the environmental work, not just all about rockets. It's it's rather good, good things in there. So, yeah, that that's the, the, the whole area of the spaceport. And as I indicated, that this part of it is um, relatively simple civil engineering in inverted commas. You, know, you gravel on membrane, making a road, and then a concrete pad. But what you have to do when you're building it is you've got to catch every chemical. So you can't have any leaks of oils. We can't have any leaks of liquid oxygen or liquid propane, even if they actually ultimately evaporate. You don't want to know what the interaction might do. Um, so we've got very uh, clever systems for recycling um, all of those um, potential risks as well. Um, to to yeah to to really be a, a a good partner to to that local environment. Sounds like a fun challenge for an engineer uh, engineering team to tackle that. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, definitely a, a challenge, but a fun one. Um, that, that's fascinating. Uh, I, I love hearing about uh, spaceport developments. It's just always super cool to me. Um, I I love asking CEOs like yourself questions about your company's long-term plans or your long-term vision for your company, um, because I'm always fascinated by the answers. Could you indulge me a little bit in that for what your vision is for Orbex? What's the long-term? I mean, at the moment, I'm just focused on getting a a launch (laughs) and a space launch. That's long-term for me today. Um, But what we're trying to do is is, um, make this more routine, more mass market, which makes it more reliable because we're going to do multiple launches, not necessarily all from this spaceport because there are restrictions on what we can do, but aim to have it. So it's almost like a, a routine taxi service as opposed to going on a bus, which is the equivalent of going on SpaceX, where you get roughly where you're going to go and then you have to walk the last bit. As goes much more precisely into the right orbit. Uh, so it makes life easier for the, the satellite manufacturers themselves as well. Plus the, the, the regular schedule uh, means that you don't get bumped off the, the bus when it's full. It, it's yours yep. to use. So that's our sort of general view of just making it more accessible uh, through that routine uh, kind of schedule of it. All the high engineering that needs to go in to make it sort of a mass production as opposed to what's traditionally a very bespoke build uh, approach to making rockets. Your rockets use 3D printing, if I remember correctly. Is that correct? Uh, yes, uh, 3D printing um, on propulsion units that, that enables them to be as light as possible. Uh, one of the challenges you have at this size of a launch vehicle is you have no room for any excess. That might seem counterintuitive to a very large one, but we simply couldn't bring it back to Earth because we can't carry the fuel to do that landing back in that way. So hats off to all that great technology, very jealous of it, but actually for our launch vehicle, I haven't got one spare gram of fuel to, to to do that. So we have to track all those problems in a slightly different way um, in order to make it sure that the stage one is uh, reusable when it comes back. So it has to be not just capable of um, surviving the launch forces, it's got to be capable of being reused after it's dropped in the sea, which is a very corrosive environment to put sensitive parts into. So that's another challenge we gave ourselves when we... So we're going to be environmentally friendly and make sure that comes through. Um, and then the, the design of the stage, what, uh, stage two, uh, means it, it never leaves debris in space. It, it will come back uh, down and burn up in the atmosphere. And that's another important part of 
at being an overall good citizen player. That is wonderful to hear. I, the, this conversation about um, how space companies, not just launch, but including launch, of course, can be good global citizens is one that I am very heartened to hear more of, and especially hearing from companies like yours uh, in terms of how they're really putting that into practice is always genuinely very wonderful to hear. It is more difficult to do, and it is it is a challenge, certainly, um, but it's wonderful to hear companies that are up to that challenge and really making it happen. Uh, so thank you for sharing all of that with me. I, I do greatly appreciate it. This has been so fascinating. Uh, before we conclude, I want to give you the floor if there's anything that I didn't ask you about that you wanted to say to the audience, I want to just give you that opportunity before we close out. Well, well on that, my, my, that last comment, I, I missed out the fact that it's biopropane. And just by choosing that fuel uh, as being a, an environmental thing we want to support, you, you actually give yourself a much greater engineering challenge. So rather than do the easy thing, which was to choose a kerosene or other fuels that other people have used, we said, no, no, we're going to go down that route. Uh, and we'll take the consequences of what that means to blowing up the brains of my engineers uh, in order to find fantastic innovative solutions uh, to that particular problem. So, so yes, it, it is built in rather than um, added on as an afterthought, kind of the way we've gone about designing that whole uh, launch vehicle launch system and that spaceport as well. We'll be right back. Now, a word from our sponsor, the Johns Hopkins University Information Security Institute, currently seeking qualified applicants for its innovative Master of Science in Security Informatics degree program. Study alongside world-class interdisciplinary experts and gain unparalleled educational, research, and professional experience in information security and assurance. Interested U.S. citizens should consider the National Science Foundation's CyberCore Scholarship for Service program, which covers tuition and a $6,000 annual professional development allowance, as well as providing a $37,000 additional annual stipend. Apply for the scholarship and the fall semester by March 1st. Learn more at cs.jhu.edu slash mssi. Welcome back. And we do love a bit of space history here on T-Minus. So here's a little on this day in history trivia for you. The European Space Agency's first human spaceflight mission lifted off 40 years ago today. Accompanied by the first ESA astronaut, Ulf Merbold, the Space Lab module took flight inside of the space shuttle's cargo bay, turning the NASA space truck into a mini space station capable of scientific research. ESA has never launched its own human spaceflight mission, but it seems that the tides may be changing. At the recent ESA summit in Spain, all 22 nationals that fund the agency agreed to open a competition for industry to propose a cargo spacecraft to fly to and from the International Space Station by 2028. This would be the first time that Europe has developed a crew transportation vehicle, and while it would be initially used to transport humans to and from the ISS, pending ESA member states' agreement, of course, it could serve other destinations beyond LEO. If... This is a big if, but if this goes through, it could result in Europe developing the capability to land its own astronauts on the surface of the moon. After all, the race to the moon 2.0 is a global affair, with the U.S., Russia, China, India, and Japan, and many others, all setting their sights on our nearest natural satellite. So it should be no surprise that the Europeans also want in on the action. Well, we wish them all the best, and we will see what happens in the coming years. That's it for T-Minus for November 28th, 2023. For additional resources from today's report, check out our show notes at space.n2k.com. We're privileged that N2K and podcasts like T-Minus are part of the daily routine of many of the most influential leaders and operators in the public and private sector. 
from the Fortune 500 to many of the world's preeminent intelligence and law enforcement agencies. This episode was produced by Alice Carruth. Mixing by Elliot Peltzman and Trey Hester, with original music and sound design by Elliot Peltzman. Our executive producer is Brandon Karp, and I'm Maria Varmazis. Thanks for listening. We'll see you tomorrow 